Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Nick Tulo streaming live from New Jersey. It's a sunny Saturday morning, and you know, I still haven't gotten my new recording studio set up in the basement. The problem is the computer that I use to do chalk talks and to do most of the ECG Academy stuff isn't fast enough to do live streaming like this. I'm actually streaming it at, at um, uh, 1080p and it's, you know, got this big iMac in front of me. So I have to uh, figure out how if either I'm going to have two computers down there or I have to get something new, but it's looking good. And it's unfortunately, um, I'm still in the mess here. <laughs> we have a little bit more work to do on the house before we can get started. So I appreciate all of you who took time out on your Saturday mornings to join us live. Jess Winder and SpaceFed, thank you so much for joining us uh, from Malaysia. Wow, uh, I, I, it's always so impressive to find people who are tuning in from, from all over the world. And the other really cool thing, I've got this really exciting news, is that um, a website from Australia, lifeinthefastlane.com, just rated the top 20 online ECG training programs, and we were number three. And that's, you know, they kind of were unhappy that I wasn't able to uh, provide category one CMEs to physicians, but I do uh, provide category one CMEs to uh, nurses and nurse practitioners and PAs in the States. So, uh, so it, it uh, but they really like this, the site. And if you guys are interested in checking it out, it's ecgacademy.com. But here we are on a Saturday morning talking about clinical stuff. It's not about uh, reading ECGs as much as talking about patients and what to do with patients. So today's topic is going to be stroke. A stroke is a very common problem. And, uh, and um, I'm just saying hi to Nicola and Ashe and Santosh and Kel Hai from Norway. Um, Kel was one of the first people who uh, started supporting ECG Academy. He's a um, really happy that you're tuning in on a Saturday morning. So anyway, stroke is um, um, a, a serious problem. In fact, now the, uh, at, at my hospital, you know, you have code 99 or code blue or whatever for cardiac problems, but now they have a, a, a BAT team, a brain attack team that uh, goes and investigates people in the emergency room who present with acute stroke because there are a lot of things that you can do now to try to break up the clot and, and uh, reduce the damage and minimize the impact of, of a stroke. But what I wanted to do is talk to you guys about strokes in general and talk about when to worry about whether a stroke might have come from the heart. And in particular, you know, how do you figure out whether to just put a patient on aspirin, which is the general rule for someone with a stroke, or when do you need to use something stronger like anticoagulation? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> good morning, Insuk. I'm glad you could join me. Um, and Ashay from India, wow, this is so cool. Anyway, so stroke, let me just show you my slide. I do this, see, um, a lot of talks on, uh, Actually, I gave a, a lecture on syncope to the American College of Physicians at New Jersey chapter. Good morning, Brian. And so here's a slide from one of my many talks, and it, it's sort of like the etiology of uh, strokes. Now, notice that on the left side here, 15% um, of strokes are hemorrhagic strokes. These are strokes that uh, arise from a broken blood vessel or an aneurysm or something. Let me just change my uh, the size of my paintbrush here because it's way too big. And so I can maybe so. So the um, strokes that arise from a broken blood vessel are treated obviously differently and they tend to occur in people with hypertension or someone who has um, vascular problems like an aneurysm that bursts. I just want to make sure I can write on this thing. There you go. But the more common type of stroke is the arterial occlusion or, um, where the, or thrombotic stroke or an ischemic stroke where part of the brain just doesn't get the blood and people suffer from neurological symptoms. And if, it, if blood flow isn't restored fairly quickly, you can wind up with significant 
disabilities because of permanent neurological deficits. So of the arterial occlusion of the thrombotic of the um, ischemic variety of stroke, you can see how I've broken it out. You have atherothrombotic, so someone, for example, who has a blockage in their carotid artery that then uh, uh, forms a thrombus and breaks off and winds up um, uh, lodging in a small vessel, the middle cerebral artery, one of the larger vessels. And um, you can often pick up evidence of this with carotid ultrasound or magnetic resonance imaging, MRA of the arteries. But the one that we're most concerned about is this one here, the cardioembolic stroke. So 20% of strokes are definitely from a thrombus or some other material that arises in the heart, often the left atrial appendage, and uh, then breaks off and travels and makes its way to one of the larger arteries in the brain. So cardioembolic strokes are often really bad. They, they affect a large part of the brain 50% of them wind up being fatal. And, and a lot of the others, patients have severe disabilities. It can be hemiparetic and it's, it's a really, they, they can, sometimes it can affect speech and, and people can wind up with aphasia. Bill Aish from North Carolina, thank you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I know y'all know uh, that I spent three years in Chattanooga, so, uh, uh, <laughs> I had to communicate with those Southern folks somehow, one way or the other. And, v and, and from Vail, wow, uh, Danica, thank you very much for joining me. The um, hypertensive patients often will get a lacunar stroke, which is a smaller stroke deep in the brain. And often those can result in um, one-sided symptoms, but they often get better, luckily. Um, but we also have this large category, 25 or 30% of strokes are referred to as cryptogenic because you look for carotid disease, you look for um, uh, evidence of clot inside the heart, you could do a TEE, but nothing shows up. So cryptogenic means we don't know why a person had this kind of a stroke. And those are the people that might have had cardioembolic stroke, they might have an arrhythmia that gave rise to a clot, but we just don't have the evidence of that. We can't be sure. Uh, so anyway, when you look at strokes in general, what are the risk factors for stroke? Let me show you this next slide. Um, age, obviously, the older you are, the more likely you're going to wind up with a stroke. The risk increases with age. Hypertension is a big one of all these. It's probably the uh, most impactful of all these risk factors. Heart failure, diabetes, obviously affect the, the state of the blood vessels, can result in an inflammatory situation. Smoking is a big one. And it's more, um, stroke is more common in, um, in males. Um, but the one that we're talking about is atrial fibrillation. And we know atrial fibrillation is very common. And in fact, all of these risk factors for stroke are also risk factors for AFib, right? Age, heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, those all lead to AFib. So it all kind of makes sense. And a lot of people think that AFib is actually just a manifestation of some underlying systemic problem, the endothelial dysfunction and, uh, 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 microscopic um, cellular anomalies in the atrium that give rise to atrial fibrillation. So it kind of all fits together, but, but this is the, the one thing that separates a, an atherosclerotic plaque in the carotid that goes to the brain. We treat those with aspirin and people who have recurrent symptoms on aspirin, then we generally add a second antiplatelet agent like Plavix. But it's the people with atrial fibrillation and a stroke, those are the ones that seem to benefit from anticoagulation. So in particular, warfarin or some of the newer uh, thrombin inhibitors or the uh, direct uh, factor 10 inhibitors, the 
So what we used to call the NOACs, the novel oral anticoagulants, well now we, the, we could leave it N, but it would be non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants. So the NOACs really become important when you're treating atrial fibrillation. But the key is, how do you diagnose atrial fibrillation? And when is it appropriate to change someone, for example, from aspirin to an anticoagulant? So um, this is uh, the CHADS VASC score. Um, and uh, so what are, the, what are the things that we're looking for? We're looking for age over 65 gets you one point, age over 75 gets you two points, uh, hypertension and diabetes, uh, a history of heart failure, a history of vascular disease, a coronary artery disease, um, and uh, if you've had a prior stroke, that gets you two points. So the, uh, the higher the, the number of points you have, the higher the annual risk of stroke. So that's why when you start to see patients with hypertension, diabetes, um, heart failure, uh, they're, they're older, and, and they've had a stroke already, their risk of a stroke is extre extremely high if they have AFib. So that's kind of like the... the uh, one thing that you're looking for is whether they have atrial fibrillation or not. So um, the thing is, how do you diagnose atrial fibrillation? Most of the time, it's not present when the patient first presents with a stroke, right? Most of the time, someone's in sinus rhythm, and you do this workup, you, you know, do carotid ultrasound, you could do an MRI, MRA if you want. Uh, some people will even do a TEE looking for th thrombus or... Uh, something called a paradoxical embolism, which, you know, if somebody has a large septal defect, like an ASD or VSD, then theoretically, a, a blood clot in the leg could get to the right side of the heart, but then cross through this septal defect into the left side, and then may, manage to get it, make its way to, to the brain. So that's known as a paradoxical embolism. And so TEE is useful to pick up septal defects, but you know, honestly, most of the time, the TEE doesn't show anything. It's very rare. I mean, in my experience, when you do a TEE on someone who had a large stroke, it's very rare to find a big clot sitting in the left atrial appendage. Uh, and, and the other thing is that, I mean, the, 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 the idea that, okay, someone goes into AFib, uh, their, their atria are jiggling around and they're not contracting properly. So now you have stasis in the left atrial appendage, right? So now a clot forms in the left atrial appendage during that episode of atrial fibrillation. And then sometime down the road, the patient perhaps goes back into sinus rhythm and the left atrium starts to contract and it expels the clot and people have a stroke. So if that was true, you would expect that the atrial fibrillation would occur just before the stroke, that, that you would be able to somehow document the, uh, an episode of AFib within days or weeks of, of a stroke because after all, you had AFib, you get the clot, then the clot breaks off, goes, you know. So, I mean, that's sort of like a, a simplistic notion of, of um, how AFib results in a stroke but it turns out to not necessarily be true. Uh, let me show you another slide here. Uh, get this up and um, this was a study that was published in 2014 and um, go back to my slide thing here. Okay, so uh, let me kind of explain what this is. So what they did was they, uh, in, in patients who had an implanted device, for example, a pacemaker, or an implantable monitor or a defibrillator. They had an implanted device and those devices uh, are, are usually really good at detecting atrial fibrillation, especially pacemakers and defibrillators. They usually have an atrial lead. They have a lead in the atrium. So if the atrium goes into fibrillation, the device can detect it and it marks what time it started, how fast it went, how long it lasted and so on and so forth. So you can get a very good idea of when people have AFib with these devices. Well, they took people who had a stroke, who had one of these devices, and they looked to see when did the AFib occur with respect to the stroke. So in this slide, let me just kind of like make it a little bit easier to see. Um, 
add a layer to draw on and we're going to change the color here. Sorry, this is all background stuff. So, okay. So this line right here, this line going down the middle represents the time of the stroke. So, and if you look at the X axis, you can see days from the stroke before these are negative 180. So this is three months, six months, one year. And this is days after the stroke. Now the gray area is basically the time that the patient was monitored. And during that, that gray area, the red regions like here and this one here, the red regions are periods of atrial fibrillation. Now notice that in a large number of patients of this study, they had 18 people who had a stroke in the setting of an implanted, implanted device. Many of the patients had atrial fibrillation, look here, a year prior or six months prior here, these couple of patients had episodes of atrial fibrillation that were six months before the stroke. And then they had nothing until the point of the stroke right here. Now there were a couple of people, four to be exact, where the atrial fibrillation occurred within 90 days of, a, of the stroke, these couple here. So, but of the, of the majority of patients, the, stro the atrial fibrillation was not temporarily related in terms of time, it did not, the AFib did not immediately precede the stroke. And then look at these patients down here. These were people who had a device, they had a stroke, but the AFib didn't show up until after the stroke with these couple of patients where you had episodes of paroxysmal AFib that occur after the stroke. And we were monitoring them before the stroke and there was nothing. Now, isn't that crazy? I mean, that just kind of blows a hole in everything we understand about AFib and stroke. And it really kind of underscores the notion that, that people who, that atrial fibrillation may just be a marker. It's an epiphenomenon. It's, it's um, a reflection of some underlying systemic disturbance uh, um, that was created by genetics, by smoking, by hypertension, by diabetes, by heart failure, by all these risk factors creates this milieu that can lead to atrial fibrillation as well as a stroke. So that may not be that a causal relationship between the AFib and the stroke, but certainly we know that if you have atrial fibrillation, your risk of another stroke is dramatically higher. So it, it is important to try to establish that a patient has atrial fibrillation or not, because when you, once you have a, a stroke and then you see atrial fibrillation, those are the patients that will benefit from anticoagulation and not just aspirin and Plavix. So um, how do you diagnose AFib in people who have had a stroke? Well, most of the time they don't have it in the hospital. You can monitor them for three days or five days or whatever, but the vast majority of the time you don't see atrial fibrillation. You can send them home with a two week event monitor or even a one month event monitor. But the problem is that it's not long enough. It, the duration of time is not long enough and you'll often miss it. See some of these people um, in, in that slide that I showed you here, let me show you this slide again. So uh, the, the people who had AFib, it occurred sometimes three months or six months after. And in fact, there was a large study known as the Crystal AF study that used implantable cardiac monitors in patients who had a stroke to see how many of them had atrial fibrillation. And they found that in the first year, 10% of patients with AFib, sorry, 10% of patients after a stroke had atrial fibrillation, but the median time to AFib was actually like 100 days. So it's important to monitor people long term. And that's why we recommend implantable cardiac monitors in patients who've had a so-called cryptogenic stroke where you don't find the serious blockage, you don't find anything wrong with the heart, uh, but these are patients who perhaps have a higher CHADS-VASC score 
they're hypotensive, they're diabetic, they're older, and so you worry that they have AFib, and so that's why we now have these implantable monitors and we use them all the time. So really quick, I wanna just show you what it looks like to implant one of these things. Um, I'm gonna play this video. This is me, actually. I was the first one in the Northeast to implant the, the Medtronic Link. I'm not a, there are other manufacturers that are uh, now marketing devices, St. Jude Abbott has one um, that um, that's, works very well. In fact, the advantage of that is that it, you can, it uses Bluetooth to communicate with your smartphone. So you can see that we made a little tiny incision, a little stab wound, and now we're injecting the device under the skin. It actually, if you use enough lidocaine, I use lots of lidocaine, then the patients really aren't aware that you're doing it. I also use some Versed to kind of like make them um, uh, forget, but once it's in, there's no discomfort and it really, really works well. So, so we had a patient who was 68 years old, hypertensive, diabetic, and he came in with a stroke and we implanted one of these things in November of 2018. And um, let me get back to my slides here. So in 2018, we implanted um, the uh, cardiac monitor. That was in November, and it wasn't until March. Uh, this is kind of a readout. You can see here's um, uh, every day. These are the days down here, February uh, 25th, March 1st, March 6th. So, so every one of these little hash marks up here is a day. And if a patient has atrial fibrillation, you'll see a bar and the height of the bar is proportional to the duration of the fibrillation. So this person from November till March, you know, like five months or so had nothing. And then suddenly he had like 16 hours worth of atrial fibrillation. You might say, well, are we sure this is AFib? Well, the device actually saves a picture of it. And here's a, this, this is uh, the, his, from, um, I'm just looking at something. Who, who might benefit, who might benefit, those are the people who have, I, I was look, just looking, it looked like my stream had um, kind of faltered there for a second. A computer, and then I kind of edit them a little bit and kind of juice them up a little bit, and then I put them on ECG Academy uh, for any basic, Intermediate and advanced level members all have access to all my live streams. And this is number 22. But I, I think what I just want to finish, since for some reason looks like my stream's not all that healthy. Um, if you have a stroke and you have atrial fibrillation, those are the people who need to be anticoagulated. So um, I, I hope that... Uh, This kind of reminds people to look for atrial fibrillation after a stroke when you're not really sure what caused it. If you don't find severe carotid disease, that you, it's not a good idea to just leave them on aspirin and hope for the best. It really takes a little bit of time to identify these high, high risk patients and then treat them appropriately. So we'll look at, um, um, uh, if you guys, I, I hope that this was a useful discussion to you. And as I said, I'll be posting this to ECG Academy in case uh, you missed any part of it. Uh, I'll look back at the recording on YouTube. And if I see that it, it really got messed up, what I'll do is repost it as, um, as just an upload instead of a live. So uh, anyone who has trouble watching it can, can go back and uh, watch it. Atlanta. So uh, I won't be doing one next week, but most likely the week after. And you know, who knows, maybe by then I'll be in the, my new studio. So anyway, have a great rest of the day and a terrific week. And I hope to see you soon. Thanks for watching.